This is WLIW-FM In Conversation, our special program that brings you dynamic voices from across our region and beyond. Welcome to In Conversation. I'm James King, Artistic Director of All Arts, which is a member of the WNET group. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Anna DeVere Smith. Anna is an actress, playwright, educator, and author. Known for her work in theater and television, Anna has received a Tony Award, the Pulitzer Prize for her play, Fires in the Mirror, is the recipient of a MacArthur Genius Grant as well as many honorary degrees and was awarded the National Humanities Medal from President Barack Obama. Welcome, Anna, and thank you for talking with us today. Oh, I'm so happy to be here with you, James. It's just great. So before we dive in, I just want to congratulate you on your most recent honor from the Museum of Modern Art. Yeah. Uh, it was an extraordinary thing when I heard that that was happening, and you were a standout amongst great company there. Well, yeah, it was an honor for sure, definitely. And I didn't see it coming, so it was an honor and a surprise. Well, I have to say, you know, I think that more and more you should be acknowledged for all the contributions that you've you provided to the field, I should say. And I've been fortunate enough to know you for a while, to work with you on occasion, and I can't think of anybody who I think deserves it more than you. So congratulations. Thank you. So, you know, when you were being introduced by the president of MoMA, she, she stated this, and I want to quote, Anna's one-woman shows have challenged us clearly, directly, and poetically to confront issues of inequality and identity in America. So others that I've heard um, talk about you have referred to you as an anthropologist, a documentarian, and a thespian. And I'm wondering, what is your response? Response or your reaction to people's efforts to try to categorize or pigeonhole you? Hmm. What a what a wonderful question. Um, I, I suppose I'm I'm flattered that people uh, want to put me in the company of things that they think are valuable. You know, if someone says that I'm an anthropologist, they think anthropology is important. If someone says I'm a journalist, they think Journalism is important. Um, the quote that sort of is, is you find most often repeated is from the New York Times that I'm the ultimate impressionist. She does people's souls. Well, if they want to put me in relationship <laughs> with people's souls, that's kind of deep. Um, so, you know, but, but my thing is also that I don't, it's fine with me that I don't appear to belong in any one place. Um, you know, I think uh, right now in our society, and I've noticed this as a teacher, as you know, James, I've been teaching for so many years now. And I would say over the last decade, something that becomes so important to students is a sense of belonging, a sense of belongingness. And I understand mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I think I solved that problem in a different way uh, that comes from having grown up as I did and in... Um, you know, a segregated town, de facto segregation, but we are still a segregated country and we're still a sort of informal apartheid country. And so right. that right. means that folks are going to have difficulty feeling like they belong because you never know when you're going to cross into a line that's right. not hospitable, right? And so to right. me, a life strategy for that is to accept that as a reality mm -hmm. and to figure out how you can move with the least amount of pain right? and still get right. something accomplished in spite of those lines. So I sort of think about uh, the non-belonging state anyway, if that makes sense in terms it of- It does, it yeah, does, and I, I like that. If somebody's that. trying to categorize me, that means they think I belong in that company. So at right. least I'm being accepted somewhere. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. So one of the other things that you've said in the past is that 
your idea was to become America word for word. That's always been an interesting idea to me. And I was wondering if you could explain for the listeners what you meant by becoming America word for word. Sure. Um, It means that I believe that, you know, all these are metaphors, right? So we talk about putting yourself in other people's shoes. We know what that means, right? It means if I were to step into your shoes, my understanding of you should be greater, right? So because I'm a dramatist and because I'm specifically in the theater, which is the art of words, it's the art of words as action or words becoming action, causing action, different from the movies where action is action, it's visual, so forth, Mm -hmm. replication Mm -hmm. of human life. But on the theater stuck on that stage, we have to make reality through words. So we believe in words as actions. I mean, and, uh, you know, people who are very religious uh, believe in words as, you know, the power of prayer as possibility, that you can make things happen. Through yes. words. That's what yes, I indeed. believe. And I believe that if I am willing to really put myself in the words of somebody else, um, particularly somebody I don't agree with, I'm closer to understanding the complexity, I guess, of humans, but I'm particularly interested in America. Uh, I'm one of, one of the biggest compliments I ever got a long time ago when I was still figuring out how to do my work was somebody said, you are an Americanist. And I thought, oh, I'm an Americanist. <laughs> I, I love this country. Uh, I love uh, so much about it. I love its problems. Um, you know, I don't feel comfortable in his problems, but let's not say I love its problems. I'm intrigued and want to know why things are as they are. Right. And so right. I do that through learning people's words. Right. So one of the one of the techniques and, you know, forgive me if I if I'm not explaining this in a way that is accurate, there's a, and there's a mimicry of sorts that you use where you actually try to adopt the rhythms of speech of people and their manners when they're speaking. And I'm wondering if you find that that's a way for you to tap into their humanity through the rhythms of the speech. Well, I'm able to, I suppose, give the illusion that I'm representing someone other than me. So it's acting, right? It's acting. And Mm -hmm. it is uh, a very external way of thinking about acting. Uh, You know, I think that in the 20th century, most American actors have thought about acting as coming from an internal truth, right? If I were to portray you at a a very um, challenging time in your life, I would try to think about, well, how did how did I have an experience like that? And I would then be carrying that around in trying to portray you. Yes. But I sort of didn't I, I wasn't as interested in that method. And mm-hmm. I was more interested in the method we had to use in um classical drama, which is to say words just exactly as they're written and in the rhythm that they're written. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And uh, and I was intrigued that people could feel like somebody else just by doing that. You know, it's also, you know, coming from the black church, too. Right. Um, I like to tell the story of uh, which I haven't told in a while being uh, in one of those big Harlem churches. Um, so it was Father's Day and it was a group of incarcerated men and they were singing that song, A Blessed Assurance. It's so beautiful. Mm-hmm. And you know how it has the mm-hmm. Petitions the part, this is my story, this is my song, praising my savior all the day long. And yes. this one man, he was like, he looked like a bullet. And he was just singing that over and over again. And of course, the people just jumped to their feet. And it was because you were able to think about, here he is incarcerated. You know, they let him out for that day or that hour. And you start thinking, well, what is his story? What is his song? Yes. Praising the Savior all the way day long. You get to feel yes. that that power of that way of surviving. Yes, yes, and it, yes. It all yes. has to do with what the whole song sounds like, <laughs> not just the words. And so that's where I'm trying to live is in the whole song that a person is 
telling me and you know and I'm interested in catastrophe because I'm a traumatist so I'm I'm interested in struggle and I'm hearing people who are in struggle and it's a huge gift. It's beautiful. Like that song, you know what I mean? Would I want to be that man? No. Do I feel he should be in that position? No. But think of the remarkable fact of the beauty of that song. Yes. Singing his struggle. I mean, that's what the black church to me, which I grew up in, I'm Episcopalian now, but I grew up in that, and I, I felt that struggle very palpably with the singing. Yes, 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 yes. I have to say, as a Black man growing up in America, that's been part of my history, and I've relied on that often when I'm trying to express myself and I'm at a loss for words. Song will come through and be that mechanism that allows me to share in a way that I when I can't find the words. So I can completely understand that. But, you know, I, I've heard you talk about, well, let me back up and say that in addition to people saying that you've created a new form of theater because of the approach you took, I've heard you talk about reimagining education and the role of the arts in shaping futures futures of communities, of com of individuals, and ultimately of our country. And I was hoping that you could talk a little bit more about that power of the art in relationship to communities, individuals, and ultimately our country. Because I think that the arts are really a salve for the soul and and have the power to save us ultimately. That's a lofty statement, but it's one I believe. So I was just hoping you could expound upon that a little bit. Well, I'm thinking about that a lot. And it's particularly because of the reckoning moment that we're in right now. And I would like to see an adjustment. Um, I'm a member of Black Theater United. Uh, that's the group. Most of us are older than the other groups. And yes. Michelle yes. And Audra and Brian Stokes Mitchell and Vanessa Williams uh, are among, Lilius White are among the ones that hate leaving people out, but Wendell, Pierce and Kenny, Leon. Um, and, you know, you come to realize, if you've been in the theater as long as me, that these... Um, projects of diversity really took hold in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so people like the individuals I've named, particularly in the 80s and the 90s in particular, helped reshape American theater. Yes, yes. By making Blackness and Black traditions a part of it, whether it was an August Wilson play or for that matter, whether it was a, a, a play out of a, a white tradition. Right. But bringing right. our presence and our experience, and not to mention the ways that many of these theaters, like the, the Wallace Grants, for example, they got money in the promise that they would diversify their audience and give other opportunities. Yes. So we really helped build these buildings. Theaters that started as storefronts, now a block long, block block big, and we have nothing. Right. Now, I know that's the bad news I'm bringing. You know, we have nothing. Mm -hmm. We have our careers. We have things about our lives. But do we have, we have black theaters in the country, but do we have them at the level of, say, Ailey or Jazz at right. Lincoln Center or the theater, the studio museum in Harlem? We do not. Right. What happened? I want to know. And why yeah. don't we? And, and why, why don't we? But so, so the, the fact is that I'm very careful right now when I talk about the power of art and the possibility of art, because I understand that structural racism exists in these institutions. I believe there are people of goodwill who believe that we must change that. But I can't just full out 
say those old phrases that we've said forever about the power of the arts because we want to get money for these our our livelihoods, right? You know, so there's lots of things you can say, but one of the best ones I've heard of late is to think of the world without oxygen. That's the uh. world without art, that it is survival. Or if you think about what happened in the pandemic in particular, you could not go through a day without getting a text or an email from someone that was hilarious, right? Yes. Or in yes. the Trump era, hilarious. Yes. So the amount yes. of humor, we survived from that. We created community. So from that fundamental way, or we know that when people are ill or struggling or, you know, think of when you listen to love songs, you so many love songs about things falling apart. Yet you fall apart. <laughs> the songs about the love affair falling apart. So there's no doubt that humans need the company of art because we are thinking, feeling, moving animals. But at the same time, I have to take a minute and raise up the bloodstained banner of struggle of people who have not gotten a fair shake. Does that ruin your program? <laughs> not at all. Actually, you know, I was going to ask you about that because one of the things that I've been looking at as I sit here in my position as artistic director at All Arts is this sort of reemergence after the pandemic. And the fact that the, all of us have been faced with a reckoning around structural racism and how do we come back or rebuild the arts ecosystem in a manner that acknowledges that there has been structural racism and yet tries to change that at the same time. I think a lot of people are in this in the phase of acknowledgement. Yes, this exists, but I haven't heard a lot of people talk about what are the solutions. And so when you bring up Black Theater United, and I know there are other groups out there that are working towards those same ideas, I am very interested in the conversations that say, these are some practical things that we can do. Um, and I'm glad that you checked me on that notion of <laughs> art is healing and and because that's all true, but there's still the struggle, as you say. So I'm curious what you would say you see as some of the paths forward as we reemerge from the pandemic, which you know, provided us with lots of challenges, but also lots of opportunities. And I always as an optimist, I'm looking at what are the opportunities in front of us. There's a, there's always a path forward. I'm mm -hmm. curious what you see that path be. Well, you know, because I'm an individual artist, I'm also coming from a very particular position, right? I'm not I'm not an institution, and I don't work at an institution. I'm right. in, uh, even as an academic, I'm 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 a professor, but I'm not. Um, you know, that's not the only thing I do. As you as we decide you said, you know, I don't, you know, I don't really belong anywhere. I'm sort of here, I'm there, and so forth. Um well let me just say something about individual artists. <laughs> I say something just about that. Because we're not a, I think that the um economy of an individual artist deserves some um consideration. And I would love to see uh um I would love to see schools of business uh, bring on individual artists as case studies mm -hmm, and come mm -hmm. up with new ideas of how we might position ourselves. Does that mean, for example, that we're better off with individual patronage than we are with institutions? Does it mean that uh, we should be thought of as small businesses and therefore might we have courses and consultants that are paid for by philanthropies or even the government? that help right. us build ourselves that way in a better way right. um, in schools and, you know, in particularly MFA programs, should everybody be so process arts um, focused or might we again have collaborations with business schools and law schools? Might we come out of this with a whole other way? Should individual artists be collectives of people who can share, for example, lawyers, you know, lawyers fees can are outrageous. And, and they're no, break not, nobody's like giving you a break at the, the hour, right. right? That's right. Uh, accountants fees are outrageous. People have been ripped off by their accountants. And so 
I would like to see a think tank surrounded with different kinds of expertise and intelligence to reposition the individual artist. And so that in 10 years, we have a whole different way that these figures are considered. Because I do think that a free agent who is nimble and who's not stuck in an institution can really cause some productive change. So, you know, the, I think that institutions only exist uh, because individual artists are out there bringing art to them, be that as a playwright or as a performer, as a musician. Without, without the individuals, the institutions don't exist. So I think the institutions have a responsibility there. And I'm wondering what you see as the role or the responsibility of the institution in relationship to the individual artists. Because having worked most of my career within institutions, I can say that individual artists don't always get the best and the fairest shake. Why not? Quote, Why, unquote. Not? Why, Why not? not? Let's start the think tank right now. Why not? What do you see from inside? See, I'm outside. I come, my lawyer makes a contract, I go to my dressing room, I pray, I go on stage, I say my lines, I go home, I go to sleep, I come back, I go to my dressing room, I pray, I say my lines. So <laughs> I'm free to get through it. What do you see? What do you see? I, I see a lack of appreciation for everything that the individual artist brings to the table. And having been a performer myself and then sitting on the other side of the table, I'm always struggling to find that balance and bring forward the value of the artist. And I and the artist often is put in a position to feel defensive, to have other people speaking for them because they don't want to come off as the bad guy. They still need the job. They want the job. They pursue, they pursued this. And the institution doesn't always place value where I think value needs to be placed in terms of the individual artist. And so for me, some of what you've talked about in terms of the process of becoming an artist through institutional mechanisms. Oh, let's let's go back to MFA programs, for instance. Maybe that's where you start to break that down and you start to talk to the people who are going to become administrators about the value of the individual artist. Um, and yeah, let me stop there. Let me start well, I mean, there. I think it's also structural, right? It's like if, if we were to, in our think tank, uh, go back and look at what the salaries were uh, in 1975 of the people who work all year long in a theater, who keep the place running, and compare that to what an actor made, and we look at the difference. An actor can barely eat in 1975. Right, right. So what? But so but but now, Ken, Ken, I mean, what is right. the it, actor's salary? I mean, I'm not talking about like if you're on Broadway and you're a star, right, right, right. right. But the non-star, what's the salary? I mean, it's just like these are questions we could ask. What is the salary? How much has it increased or not since 1975? How much have the other salaries increased or not since 1975? So there's, I think, that unfortunately, there's a basic idea that needs to be questioned. Because we don't have government support in our country to the extent they do in Europe, for example, is am I is it considered that it's compensation enough for me to put my voice out there, to put mm -hmm. myself out there, mm -hmm. put mm -hmm. my message out there? Sometimes mm -hmm. I think folks think that's compensation enough, and if you and even that's you your reward, back, that's my reward. Yes. And it's not, we're yes. not the only ones. Same thing with teachers. It, it's very dangerous yes. when people say it's very rewarding, isn't it? Because yes. that means you're willing to work harder than I am for exponentially less money. Right. right. Because you're some sort of a special being who doesn't need the reward of this awful thing called money. But that's right. just not the way the world works. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not campaigning for greed. But it becomes real serious when you see that people can't take care of themselves. And one of the things that's 
very sobering to me right now. When I found out about a week and a half ago that Robbie McCauley died. Yes, yes. I don't think you can name 20 actors who started when I did, or playwrights who started when I did in the 70s. Black who weren't women. touched by can you name 20? Can you name 20 black women who started in the 70s? No, Still I cannot. Right? I cannot. And so Zaki's gone. Blondell Cummings is gone. Yes. Robbie's gone. I mean, you know, Lori Carlos is gone. And they all had health problems. Did they have decent insurance? I don't know. Did they have decent medical care? Last summer, there was a really compelling argument in the New York Times of a young scholar about like just the so-called illness of being black in the first place. That is your fault. And so when Robbie died, I had already been thinking about where is everybody yes. that I started with? Yes. And it's really upsetting because it's like, has the American theater been inhospitable to my generation of black women? Yes. And that's when, do you have enough money to take care of yourself? Is real. It comes. That's right. That's right. And, and I have to say that gets at the root of my problem because your value is not just your voice. It's not just your ability to art, be articulate, to sing, to look good when you're out there, but it's your humanity. You're bringing your humanity and sharing that with everybody. And that's where I see the lack of value. And, 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 I'm putting it on the theater because that's the industry that I've worked in all of my life. But I think that's a problem for all of us in America in particular. And I think it's something that I've watched you tap into in a very subtle way because you offer us points of view that are different from our own, but that, are, that are open our eyes to other ways of perceiving what are really tremendous problems that face us all. So for that, I thank you. And, and, and I have to say, I hope that people learn from your choice to not just do it the way everybody had been doing it up until you came along. Cause you made us all think a little bit differently about how we could talk to each other how we could share our humanity with each other. And but you know what? I, I mean, I wouldn't be here without the intellectual rigor of Adrian Kennedy. And you yes. see her do something a whole different way. Yes, a that's whole true. Way. And Zaki. And Zaki. And to Zaki. Yes. A whole different way. Yes. And so, you know, it's very mysterious how we come up with what we come up with. I like to quote when I interviewed Tony Morrison at the at the 92nd Street Y. And she said she knows she's ready to write when she's fretting about something. And mm -hmm. I do think mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, that many artists are like there's some problem or some. I like the expression question. What's the question you look to come with a question that you're trying to you know, you're perplexed about, you know, that's where it all starts, I think. And, and so, I mean, for me, without Zaki and Adrian Kennedy, I, it's just, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm pleased that people th thought I did something new. You know, I, when you look at the world, you want to do something new. <laughs> you want to do something new. So that's nice. But I also have to always, especially evoke those two names. Yes, I, I think you're right. And Adrian Kennedy in particular, she stood out as somebody who really, really pushed the envelope at a time when everybody's going, is that is that a little bit crazy? I'm, I'm not sure. And well, were you in the public theater for the production of a movie star has to star in black and white that Joe Chaikin directed? No, no. I mean, I, right I, then I, and there, I was interested because it's a white man directing a black woman's play. And I mean, that was an extraordinary piece of theater. <laughs> okay. okay. I want everybody out there who's producing to think about bringing that back. That's an extraordinary piece. 
So, Anna, before we go, um, I just want to talk a little bit about the fact that we're in a new century. I think there's something really dramatic about the fact that we're no longer in the 20th century. We're in the 21st century. For me, again, the optimist, this is about possibility. This is about opportunity. We've talked about the pandemic presenting those things. But I think there have been many moments in these first 20 years of the 21st century where we can find those nuggets of opportunity. I'm wondering what you would say to your students, to the artists who are budding out there, who are listening right now, what would you say to them as they look forward from this moment in time where we've crossed the line, so to speak, from one century to the next? Just two words, change stuff, that's it. I like that. And with that, I'm going to promise you, I'm going to continue to try to change stuff because that's going to make all the difference. I want to say thank you, Anna. It was great. It was great speaking with you. I want to do the think tank. So when you pull it all together, please invite oh, me to the party. I thought you were going to pull it together, man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too busy trying to make my few deadlines. You could pull that together. Okay, so I got the think tank. All right, you, you come got and it. be a guest speaker at our think tank. I'll be happy to be there. All right, hey, thank okay. you again for joining thank us. You. I'll talk to you again soon. All right, bye bye. Thanks for joining us for WLIW FM in conversation, our special program that brings you dynamic voices from across our region and beyond. And for supporting WLIW-FM, heard over the air at 88.3, streaming on your favorite apps, and online at WLIW.org radio.